When you remove, when you take out the mundane, repetitious moments that compose the vast majority of our lives, you remove that and you remove sleep and then you have a very, you have a very short book. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you as always. Hope you're doing well. Get that coffee. So I've got a great short book for you today. Just wanted to get one more in before I finish Crime and Punishment. Guess what? Another book about death. As if you weren't depressed enough already from that McCarthy. Today is These Possible Lives by Fleur Yegi, originally published in 2009. And the English translation here was published by New Directions a few years back in 2017. Got this, I believe, in uh, one of the Box Walla boxes. So thank you very much to them. Great folks over at Box Walla. I've never read Yegi before. This is the first of hers that I've read. I believe I skimmed a description of Sweet Days of Discipline, but I never picked that up. Or another one of hers called I Am the Brother of XX. Um, she kind of been on my radar, but I was never strongly drawn to her. Um, it's a shame. After reading this, I realized it's my loss and I should have come to her sooner. This is a very, very short collection of three essays, three biographies of authors, well-known authors, uh, three short life stories, miniature biographies, if you want. All true, though maybe not without some fictitious embellishment, I imagine. But maybe not, you know. They are Thomas De Quincey, John Keats, and what caught my eye in particular about this book was the inclusion of the third life, the third author, the French author Marcel Schwab, who wrote a wonderfully, horrifically depressing short book, translated by my friend, the poet Kit Schluter, called The Book of Manel, which I reviewed several years back, Highly recommend it, excellent book. Which I can't recommend to you enough, but save it perhaps for when the sun comes back out for a lot of you. This is the plus about living in Florida, you see. I can read abysmally depressing literature year round. I walk outside, the sun's still shining. It's just the gators, hurricanes, and Florida man I have to worry about. Keats I've never read. Uh, I've got De Quincey's Confessions of an Opium Eater on the shelf. Thanks a bunch, Jeff, really appreciate it. Fleur Yegi is a Swiss Italian author, still alive in her 80s, who grew up speaking several languages, including Italian, which she writes in exclusively, I believe. When she was younger, she was a model, and she married another author named Robert Colasso, whom I've heard very good things about, but have not yet read. Unfortunately, he passed away last year. Rest in peace. Yegi is very secretive. There aren't many interviews with her, and I've read she's a bit of a recluse. That's an understatement. A, a translator of hers called her a monumental loner, actually. Uh, and I totally get it. That's basically me. When I'm reading her, I feel like I'm in good company. She's kind of an endearing personality. In this one interview, I found link below for the, uh, the New Yorker. Her and the interviewer discuss her, her swamp green typewriter, which she's very proud of, and a swan that she befriended when she lived near Berlin. And in the same interview, there was a particularly interesting reply to the following question. In general, does it take you a long time to write? I don't know. I hardly write at all anymore. I have to think back to the time when I wrote. When it happens, it's like a little story of consumption. I sit there for hours before the typewriter. I look outside, I look inside me, and nothing comes out. For months, sometimes even for years. The more time passes, the more I think I have no existence. A little story of consumption. That definitely perfectly summarizes uh, two of the stories in this book. Those would be Keats and Schwab, although consumption does not affect Schwab, it uh, affects somebody else. That response certainly seems to evoke the same tone as uh, this book. She believes, above all, that it's always preferable to be silent. And so one can't help but wonder if she was trying to stay as close to that mantra as possible while still relenting, you know, to the artistic compulsion to write a book. What is so striking about these possible lives is how it demonstrates the true brevity of an existence, of a human life. When you remove, when you take out the mundane, repetitious moments that compose the vast majority of our lives, you remove that and you remove sleep and then you have <laughs> a very, you have a very short book. Certainly when life is going well, it goes by faster. And when it isn't, it's uh, torturously extended, wherein every single moment is felt. Some of the moments in this book of the lives of three men are agonizingly painful. And that lends a profundity, a weight, a, a substance, and makes the story feel perhaps longer than it really is. But yeah, you could say that same thing for just about anybody's life who lives to old age, you know? I'm a recluse myself. Expressing your love to friends and family around the holiday season is, of course, important. But Christmas shopping isn't exactly on the top of my list of desirable things to partake in. I imagine you're probably similar. Especially as we get closer to the holiday, right? Traffic, crowds. Nevertheless, it's coming up. So perhaps you can save some time and money by simply going with a sure thing. So might I suggest you pick up a beautiful watch from the sponsor of today's video, Nordgreen. Their gift sets are already discounted by 20%, but you can get an additional 15% off by using the code BTF. The link is below. Nordgreen is a Danish watch company based out of Copenhagen that sells watches designed by the award-winning Jakob Wagner. 
They're a company that care deeply about people and the environment, placing a high emphasis on sustainability, ensuring that all steps from production to shipping to delivery be sustainable, and they have a very tasteful selection of both men and women's watches. This watch I have on here is my favorite that I own. It's the Pioneer model, gunmetal with the black dial, 42 millimeters with a three link strap. The straps are interchangeable as well, and there's plenty of styles to choose from. Leather, mesh, or metal links, tons of great options. Their packaging is very nice as well. You'd never know, but they're actually made out of recycled paper and plastic bottles. And their shipping boxes are made out of FSC certified cardboard paper, which makes sure that the material comes from responsibly managed forests. Nordgreen also has a giving back program, where they're donating to three global NGOs. So for each watch purchased, a portion will be donated to an important cause. And they encourage you to choose the one that most resonates with you. But the causes shall be receiving an equally distributed portion from the watch regardless. So save some time this holiday season, and don't forget to use the code BTF to get 15% off. And you can still get your order delivered in time if you order it by December 18th. So, no time to waste. The link is below. Please check it out. Thanks a bunch. And Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to you all. Fleur Yegi's style is one of stylistic reduction. It's a game of how much she can say or evoke with as few words as possible. Evocation by revocation. And the result is striking. The book feels larger than it is, because by the end you've traversed the length of three lives, complete with the most remarkable events in under 60 pages. It's interesting why she chose these three men, um, and all of them are men, which is also interesting. But I wonder if there was something uniting them other than you know her, her fascination with them as artists. All of them were writers of a kind. All of them had romantic lives, though all of them had miserably dark endings. Though, frankly, if we're being real. Who has an ending that isn't dark and miserable, right? He died and it was just fine. Da -da 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 -da. This is the end of Keats. Stretched out on his bed, he gazed up at the rose pattern and the blue ceiling tiles. His eyes grew glassy. He spoke for hours in a lucid delirium. He never lost his faculties. He prepared Severn for his death. Severn is a guy watching over him. He wondered whether he'd ever seen anyone die before. He worried about the complications that might come up. He consoled Severn and told him that it wouldn't last long and that he wouldn't have convulsions. He longed for death with frightening urgency. On the 23rd of February, he worried about his friend Severn's breathing, how it pressed on him like ice. He tried again to reassure him, it will be easy. Dusk entered the room. From when Keats said that he was about to die, seven hours passed. His breath stopped. Death animated him in the last moment. After the autopsy, Clark said that he couldn't understand how Keats had survived so long. Fanny's last letters, never read by anyone, were sealed in his coffin. After the funeral service, the police took possession of the apartment on Piazza Spadnia. They stripped the walls and floor and burned all of the furniture. And that's the end of it. The end indeed. Dark, but fascinating, and beautifully written. Beautifully written. Certainly the book anticipates and is a way of meditating on or confronting the death that Yegi herself is facing. I'm sure it doesn't eliminate the anxiety surrounding it, but perhaps there is a modicum of control or dignity that is gained by gazing into one's own end, so to speak. So it seems to me at least. And I don't want to give you the wrong idea. It isn't that the book is depressing, at least for me. It's just intense. It gets right to the point, as you can you can hear when I read it. But there is an almost uh, Edward Gorey quality to her work. It's these compact portraits of decaying life, and it's very focused on their deaths. Variations on a theme. It's almost a, a miniature gothic novel. Right, except there isn't any, um, there aren't any elements of the supernatural, uh, which is so compelling because it really does feel like it after having read it because it's so. How would you put it? It feels like you're. Well, I mean, yeah, it feels like you're reading fiction, but you are actually reading the lives, the real lives of three men, and. Uh, her ability to do that was mesmerizing. It was uh, uh, entrancing. It's ghostly, uh, kind of ethereal, and hazy. Uh, yeah, they read as though they were dreams, but these events actually happened. And her, she captures the tone and, and qualities of the characters of these men, of these artists, perfectly. It goes by so fast, it's almost difficult to, to understand upon first read, I think, how much of a master she is, Yegi. She's really, really good. I highly recommend you read it, um, especially if you want to be a writer. I really think this is like, 
like, I don't know if it gets better. She's doing so much with so little. It's, it's very impressive. In the same way as, you know, the greats, who were the great minimalists. But, um, but she's even better than them because it's not a, it doesn't have the, the stripped down style, which is very contrived uh, to some degree, I think, uh, of, of Raymond Carver in, and, you know, his editor, what's his name? And it's not the utilitarian kind of stripped down minimalism of Hemingway. It's more evocative than that. So it's, it's something totally unto herself, right? The manner of her storytelling is much like an adventure tale with broad swaths of action reduced to these tight, compelling sentences. Just, just the pure distillation, the essence of the actions or events that occurred. So there's no wasted time. It's kind of riveting, actually. It reminds me a bit of the Argentinian author Cesar Ayra in that respect. I really like his work. And uh, Episode in the Life of a Landscape Painter is a beautiful, beautiful book. Very short, wonderful book. Uh, highly recommend that one. Um, yeah, there are parts of her that remind me of his style, but of course it's very different. Uh, she's, yeah, see, see the, the word people are gonna throw around is like cold or icy or like, you know, what have you. She's, yes, but no, it's not Brett Easton Ellis, right? It's not that kind of cold. Um, it's not the less than zero cold, which is actually closer to Hemingway in my opinion. She is closer to Ira. Um, she's closer to, I don't know, I'm trying to think, I'm like trying to compare. I don't know if I've read somebody who has quite her style. And these sentences she constructs are gorgeous in their brief power. Brevity really is a soul of wit, as Shakespeare said. That guy knew a thing or two. She was also friends with Thomas Bernhard, a caustic but often hilarious author of novels such as The Loser and Woodcutters, both of which are exceptional and which I highly recommend. You can pick up a certain dry humor in her book, uh, reminiscent of him, such as this description of Schwab near the beginning of his life. Marcel was proud of his lineage, yet often preferred not to frequent people of his lineage. Yegi discusses this kind of frost within herself, this frost of poetry or something. And there is a very cold quality to her writing at first glance. Uh, and, it's, it's, and it seems like her character, though of course not knowing her, I have no idea, a kind of curt almost confrontational depiction of the less than kind truth of life and reality. Yet simultaneously, there's this deep emotional substance, like uh, as if you can feel kind of this, the heat of the Earth's core emanating from thousands of miles away. What it is? Well, it's hard to define. It's barely there, but it's beautiful. Better than food. I'd love to reread this one. Of course, you know, it makes us wonder what our lives will look like, you know? What if you were to stop your life in a narrative at this point and imagine the rest of your life in various different short biographies. What kinds of inventive twists and turns would you come up with? Well, if we were adhering to realism, for me it would probably be a pretty boring read, but there you go. So you should read it. Those of you, of course, who enjoy Thomas Bernhard, and also if you enjoyed that one I reviewed uh, about a year ago, a little more, from Alain Paul Malau called uh, An Evocation of Matthias Stimberg. There were a lot of similarities, I felt. Another author, Tempted by Silence, right? Yeah, this Austrian literary austerity, it's a thing. I think anything this short that packs a punch this heavy is definitely worth your time. Coffee time. For those of you who are new, thank you very much for stopping by and watching. I take all the names of the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video to the show. I place their names in this mason jar, and for every review I do, I pull out a name, and whoever's name I pull out is sent a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing, plus a bag of delicious coffee roasted by yours truly. And if you would like to get in on that and help support the show, I sincerely appreciate it and I'm very grateful. For donating a dollar or more on Patreon, you'll get access to all these reviews ad-free, plus all the awesome stuff listed below. Please check it out. Thank you very much to all the patrons and best of luck. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Gregorio, Gregorio T. Thank you very much, Gregorio. You're going to receive These Possible Lives by Fleury Yigi, plus a bag of coffee, and I'll be with both. Cheers, and happy holidays. Please subscribe if you haven't already and hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed this and always remember, Bring a book wherever you go. All right, take care of yourselves. Have a great night. Happy holidays. Talk to you soon. Ciao.